it is exact six o'clock. <clears throat> we can get started. Uh, it is uh, my honor to be moderator for today's presentation. It is uh, People to People International Dalabar chapter's first such presentation, the meaning the virtual presentation. Um, just briefly about People International. After being a hero and the winner of the World War II, President Eisenhower recognized and realized that wars and fighting were not the answer to the word peace. So actually he made a famous statement saying, the guns and bullets are not the answer. Governments and politicians do not bring peace. It is the people to people who can bring the peace around the world. As such, he started this organization, People to People International. He even invited um, President Khrushchev from Russia who came to the White House. Um, history tells us that meeting didn't go that well, but years later, his granddaughter, Mary Jane Eisenhower, went to Russia. They had a very meaningful and emotional get together in which he mentioned how he was at White House and his grandpa got mad. So the mission of people to people from the very beginning has been um, peace through understanding. And the headquarter, international headquarter, has always been in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. Um, many of us had several opportunities to meet with the president and CEO, who was the president and CEO for 30 years, Mary Jane Eisenhower, his youngest um, granddaughter. And uh, now for the last two years, uh, his son has been the president and CEO, and he has also visited us twice. Uh, there are lots of different activities that all around the world, different chapters organize. All from Newcastle and uh, their main target is to help people develop a better understanding of Newcastle cultures, Newcastle. cultural differences, and uh, relevant information. Uh, one of the most well-known program is uh, what is called student ambassador. So the students of uh, high school and junior high school, they visit uh, different countries. Um, uh, it is not uncommon that uh, uh, someone from the headquarter, like president uh, uh, himself or herself, they join those children and they meet with the dignitaries, even like a Queen of uh, Queen Elizabeth. They have visited, so overall, it's a very good experience, and um, many people look forward to it. I have been involved with People to People Delaware from almost when it started, and it has been a very rewarding and meaningful experience. And I feel honored to be asked to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Jack Keogh, who is a very well educated, very informed, very learned person who has uh, been into international business coach for many years. He has lived in different countries like Mexico and uh, you know, different parts of uh, Europe. He was born and raised in Ireland, but um, has lived in other countries. If I remember correctly, uh, Spain and Italy, maybe even France, and he can speak uh, several languages. Um, uh, his um, career, if I could call that, started when 
uh, he was enrolled by a missionary and af after a year or two he started realizing it was really a cult so it was a cultural shock in a way maybe that's where his interest started from learning other cultures and uh, i think the the best introduction of um, jack is jack himself by that what i mean is what you are going to hear today his sense of humor his depth of knowledge and vast experience for me above all he is a good neighbor and a good friend we talk to each other these days almost on a daily basis when we are walking around so with a lot of pride and pleasure i introduce jack keo thank you salim um, sure. it's always hard to live up to an introduction like that you know uh, my mother couldn't have said it better probably um, so thank you very much thanks for inviting me it's sort of fun to be on a zoom conference uh, i guess the initial idea was that we were going to get together in person and then this pandemic came along and then uh, everything else that's happened uh, i assume we'll have a zombie apocalypse in the summer or something like that just to keep it interesting but anyway um let's jump in everybody can hear me okay i guess and uh I think what we've agreed, if there are questions, I, I thought, um, and it was basically Salim's suggestion, that I speak for about a half an hour and try and keep it light. And then uh, if you have questions, you can type them in the chat box and then uh, Naveed will read them out to me uh, when we get into the question thing. And that way I can try and concentrate on the answers while he can help us with the questions. So anyway, I, I suppose to put it in context, and so you know where I'm coming from in all of this, I suppose you could say I was trained as a missionary. And as Salim said, I lived in Ireland all my life. I was born and raised in Dublin. My wife is from Dublin. Um, and then I studied in Spain, and I studied in Italy for six years, and then I worked in Mexico for about 10 years. And then uh, I came to the States, worked here for maybe five or six years, and then went on an assignment to Gabon in Central West Africa. And so uh, coming back from Africa, then I sort of had a more secular work experience, which involved working on, and this is sort of relevant to the theme, reconciliation between the North, between the communities in the North, in Northern Ireland and the South of Ireland. As you all remember, there was a lot of conflict there and uh, so we were working on peace through understanding in Ireland. And then I was involved uh, for, for a number of years, about six years, with the teachers union in New York City without ever really having been a teacher in a school uh, other than in the university, I guess. And, um, but it was involved in union contract negotiations with the city in New York. So that was sort of interesting from a cultural perspective. And then um, in the corporate world, I ended up managing the relocation functions of a big Fortune 500 um, company. So relocation about sending people to other countries. And from that, the company that I was with, Prudential, Prudential Insurance up in New Jersey, they acquired what was then the premier um, cross-cultural training company in the world. It was called Moran, Stahl & Boyer. So I ended up running Moran, Stahl & Boyer, and then it became Prudential Intercultural, but it was a very, very prestigious group out of Boulder, Colorado. And then finally, when I left, um, when I left Prudential, um, after, after about 12 years there, I set up my own little company and ended up focusing on multicultural team building and what we might call executive coaching and a little bit of cross-cultural training on the side but it was really helping senior level expatriates who let's say are sent to china how do they manage the chinese team and then it turns out that it's not just a chinese team but there might be two italians on the team three spaniards two americans so how do you manage a multicultural team and then that got sort of pulled into the whole notion of executive development how do you become a better leader uh, across cultures? So that's where I come from. That's where these ideas all come from. 
And then in my work from the cross-cultural perspective, other than having lived in those six countries that I mentioned before for long periods of time, they, they were not just short visits, but I've probably done business in, uh, I think it's about 25 countries, pretty much everywhere in Europe. Uh, and then some of Asia, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, um, Thailand, and whatever else makes up the 25 countries. So this whole notion, uh, we were talking about what would we call this little conversation, and I guess we came up with the notion, the cultural um, dividend. And you're all pretty familiar with why we want to understand other cultures and what we get from it, but where did all of this come from? Like, what, why do we call it cross-cultural training, or, or the word I prefer is actually um, intercultural training. There's a subtle distinction there. It really started, I suppose, with traders who went from one country to another and came back and told people, if you want to do business uh, in Canada, well, this is what you have to do. And if you want to go there, this is what you have to do. And the other big group that got very involved in cross-cultural experiences early on were missionaries. The missionaries later involved, got, evolved to get more involved with uh, language than they really did with culture. They weren't all necessarily interested in adopting the new cultures. It was to bring their culture to the, to the native culture. So they focused a lot on language. But a lot of the early work was done by missionaries and traders. And then if you jump to the 1800s, I suppose, which isn't a big jump, you had the cult cultural um, anthropologists, the Margaret Meads of the world, who started to talk about how culture affects behavior. And I, I was asking at the beginning, what year was People to People founded? It was founded in the 50s. And that's when uh, a, a very significant American anthropologist, linguist, psychologist came on the scene called Edward Hall, Edward T. Hall. And he ended up being hired by the US Foreign Service Department to help train US diplomats going overseas. How could they better understand the cultures that they were going to and how could they adapt culturally, be more efficient, more productive? From that, um, Edward Hall is oft quoted. Uh, his famous saying that I should probably use later on again is culture, as we describe it, is invisible. And it's most invisible to the people who live in that culture. So the people who live in the US culture are not even aware there's a US culture. People who live in an Irish culture, well, they say, yeah, there's an Irish culture, but if you ask them to explain what it is, we don't do too well. And the good analogy is a goldfish in a bowl. It's very conscious probably of the bowl and maybe what's on the other side of the bowl, but it's not conscious of the water. So Edward Hall was the one who pointed to that our culture is like the water this is my version of it in the goldfish bowl it's it's invisible to the people who, who live it so it, it went from there to training for the peace corps they did a huge amount of work on cross-cultural training then the u.s military got involved in it and still do they have some very good uh, cross-cultural training programs and where i came on the scene it was really with u.s business it was really a, a company like uh, Prudential that opened up a bank in Mexico City, and we had a very successful uh, CEO from Japan who we brought to Mexico. And so he came in with a sort of a Japan Prudential American perspective to Mexico. And the poor man got lost totally, like uh, wanted to redesign the size of the toilet stalls and eliminate all the big offices for executives, which are very germane to being an executive in Mexico. You're, you're calibrated on the side of your, size of your, your office. Uh, this man who is Japanese, as I say, you could see the cultural influences there and the trouble that he got into when he, he just didn't buy into the um, Mexican style of architecture. And the other thing I suppose that you could say that happened too is there have been offshoots of this whole intercultural training that are certainly germane to the situation today, but they're not directly related to it, which becomes cultural sensitivity training, uh, diversity training, uh, gender training, all, all of the trainings to manage differences that, um, that, that sort of spring forth from how do you, how do you manage differences? 
So having said the word differences, and if, if this is getting very boring, uh, just say something there in the chat, say this is pathetic, we're falling asleep, and, um, and let me know, I'll, I'll try and liven it up a little bit. But there, there are all sorts of differences, um, three of which I'd, I'd just like to highlight very quickly. There are individual differences, and a silly example might be that uh, I have eaten a snake once, or I like snake. I, I actually haven't, but, but go with me on that. That would be an individual thing. So that's differences that are attributed to an individual. Then you have differences that are attributable to human nature. And pretty much across all cultures, it seems to be common to all cultures, people are afraid of snakes. So that would be a human nature difference. So the individual one is maybe I eat a snake. The human nature one is I'm afraid of snake. But the cultural component of it is when we attribute evil to the snake, when the snake becomes a symbol, if you will, of evil. So it's just good to get those differences out of the way because I, I recall thinking about what I was going to say today. One of the first really big interventions that I was involved with that I got paid for was with a petroleum company, an oil company, in Shanghai. So I go to Shanghai and the problem essentially was some very senior uh, Chinese executive who everybody said like it's a cultural difference, we just can't get along, he can't manage the team, see if you can help them out. And to make a long story longer, the, um, the problem really wasn't one of culture so much as it was one of personality. This particular executive was a total pain. He had a terrible personality. He was a very annoying person. He annoyed the Chinese, he annoyed the Americans, he annoyed the Italians who were there. And so it wasn't entirely a cultural difference, which then brings you into, you know, sometimes we attribute uh, differences in, in culture to what are actually differences in the personality of people from those cultures. And so to go down into the depths of it all and how we actually form our notion of culture, uh, that's really what we're going to talk about today. And I, I, it's actually going to be quite brief. Um, they say, tell people what you're going to talk about, then tell them what you're going to talk about, then tell them what you talked about. I'm going to give you a model to understand culture. And so that you can sort of just warm your brains up to the notion. You'll realize that, for example, in a country like China, they value, uh, let's say, hierarchy. No, I didn't mean to do that, sorry. Um, are we all still here? Did I lose everybody? Can you see me? Yes, everything is good, Jack. You can see me? Oh. Jack, your video is frozen, I think. Um, Jack has dropped, so we'll give it a moment until he joins back. Uh, I can't see anybody. Can you guys yeah. see me? Yep, Jack, we can see you now. Yeah, something happened, uh, so the whole thing dropped. So anyway, I can see myself, which is very entertaining. Uh, and then I can see you. Um, let's say, may I ask? Uh, <clears throat> Looks like technical difficulties on Jack's side. Touch it. Please. Why are you lifting it? Don't look. Yeah, we're all Okay, I see Jack has joined but without video. Yeah, he just needs to touch the correct button, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, <clears throat> Okay, Jack. Welcome back. Uh, you're mute. Okay. I said it's doing this random bits. That's twice it just completely dropped, and I'm on a wired connection, so I don't know what's happening. But anyway, I'm back. Okay. So I think we were talking about uh, a quick thing about differences. We talked about individual, human nature, cultural, and then to to know what where it affects business and what so uh, other things. It's let's say china would be a very hierarchical structured culture so you send an american over there whether to study or marry to a chinese person or working in china the american would tend to be much more informal and is going to run into all sorts of complications with his chinese colleagues his or her chinese colleagues because the chinese will be very careful who sits first at the table who orders from the menu who's the one who makes the first speech and in 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 the states we're much more about equality and far less about hierarchical structure or a classic one is and i saw it when, in a, when an australian went to thailand the australians are not terribly unlike the irish they tend to uh, they want to be friendly and they tend to be very informal and a lot of their business relationships are based on creating sort of a friendly environment. But the informality is what gets them into trouble or gets us into trouble when we go to a place like Thailand. Uh, because the, Thai, the, the Thais would say these people are, are, are like, they're really gross. They're, they're not educated at all um, because that's not the way we do business here. So to, to delve a little bit more into that, I wanted to show you where these cultural biases start to um, come from and i'm going to show you a couple of maps now let's see if this comes up it should uh, and i think you can see this this is a map that i grew up with in school when i was a kid in ireland right and as you all know this here in the center is ireland and beside it is england and for us that was the center of the world you know, and the States is over here and the Wild West, and then you have the rest of the world over here. But our world was the center. Now, on the other hand, that's not the, uh, that is not the view of the world that you grew up with in the United States. The one you grew up with in the United States is this one, where the United States is the center of the world. And, you know, Newark, uh, Delaware is almost in the very center. So our world revolves around this. And then you say, if you're Irish, where's Ireland? Oh, wait, it's way over here. And look at where Australia is. That's a different picture of the world. Then if you're from Asia, well, this is the center of the world. And then you say, where's Ireland? Oh, it's over here. And the states, New York, Delaware would be over here. And though this map is actually not used, but if the Australians use the world, this is probably what we would be looking at. And then that makes it a lot more complicated because you say now, uh, oh, well, where is Ireland? And maybe it's somewhere down here and uh, Newark might be over there. So my point is here that, um, let me get rid of that, that even from the maps that we grew up with looking at them in school, we've already created a worldview that uh, that we just grow up with and we take it for granted now how does that worldview affect us well i think the quickest way to help you figure this out i'm going to share another uh, slide with you and it's a questionnaire and i want you each one to answer it uh for yourselves this is from a fellow called Fons Trumpenars, who is one of the gurus of intercultural communication. What would you do in the following circumstance? You're riding in a car driven by a close friend when he hits a pedestrian. There are no other witnesses. The pedestrian is bruised, but not badly hurt. The speed limit is only 20 miles per hour. But you noticed your friend was going at 35 miles an hour. Your friend's lawyer tells you that if you will testify under oath, meaning if you will lie and say he wasn't doing 35 miles an hour, he was doing 20 miles an hour, your friend 
will suffer no serious consequences. Now, what do you do? I've asked that question around the world. Uh, if you ask that question in the United States, most people instinctively, almost immediately will say, I tell the truth, I will not lie to defend my friend. If you ask that question in Mexico or pretty much anywhere in Latin America, not everywhere, but most of the Southern Hemisphere, and in fact in Asia also, and in Europe also, you'll find a completely different answer. They would be more inclined to say, well, yes, initially, if an American asked the question, they would say, oh yes, we would tell the truth. But when you talk about it a little bit more, uh, it's not so much that they would lie as they would embellish uh, the story to protect their friend, because they value friendship and relationships pretty much more than anything, certainly in a way more than we do. Now, it doesn't mean that they lie or that they don't have good values, but you'll find the answer changes. If you ask this question in Germany, you'll get, well, was the pedestrian killed? Was the pedestrian badly injured? What, what exactly happened to the pedestrian? Was there damage to the car? Was there this? And they will rationalize a whole bunch of questions because their culture will be quite analytical. And then they will qualify their answer, which is probably that they won't lie. But by the time they get to saying they won't lie, they, they've gone through a huge amount of the rationalization. So that's to say that where these answers come from depends on the value systems that we have acquired in our culture. Now, all of this is to prepare the following slide, which is really what this whole presentation is all about. And it's a model to understand culture. Now, the point of understanding culture is to think, what's it really all about? When we're talking about culture, what do we mean? And let me say that, you know, there are a bunch, there are at least, I don't know, maybe 15 images that one can use to talk about culture. There's everything from an onion that you peel off the layers to the iceberg, which I find the iceberg is the most used one. And I think it's, it's probably still the best, even though it's an old one. And the part that you see above with the water is what the captain on the Titanic saw. The part that was below the water is the part that actually sunk the Titanic. Now, if you take, a, let's say, when I first came to the United States and I came through Kennedy Airport, uh, and walked out into the street of New York, what did I see? Well, I saw the huge buildings, the spectacular architecture, the canyons that are streets. I saw very heavy traffic, but very organized. Uh, where I came from, I thought it was very organized traffic in New York. I noticed the way people dressed. I, I noticed a very frantic pace of life. I noticed that if I asked somebody for directions, it was almost, please, I'm too busy. You, you don't bother me. I've got places to go, things to do. And all I saw was the behavior. Now, if I thought that I now understood US culture, American culture even, based on what I have just seen and described, you would all tell me, no, that's not what the States is about at all, because go out to North Dakota and it would be completely different. Go to Montana, it would be different. Go down to Florida, it would be different. You've just seen the tip of the iceberg. You've seen the behavior. So if I want to understand American culture, I need to dig deeper. And if each one of you and everybody on the call wanted to better understand any other culture, I suggest you apply this model to your own culture. In other words, Americans take this and say, okay, this is how it would work in the States. If you're Mexican, you'd say, this is how it works in Mexico. If you're Ger or you want to understand German culture, figure out the answers to these categories uh, for the country that you're interested in. And that's why we call this a cultural model. Now, below the water, there are three big groups that are, are the basis for everything. One are the beliefs that you don't necessarily immediately see, but they're there and they're invisible. And there's the value system that you don't immediately see, but they're there. And finally, there are assumptions. The things that are taken for granted in every culture, they may not be written down, 
but you're brought up in that culture to believe that they're true. Now, this is what the specialists would call really deep, deep culture. And this does not change from one year to another. This uh, takes many, many generations to evolve. And, and I think one of the mistakes we make is we think that that deep level of culture changes as fast as sometimes we might want it to or think that it should. And you might say to yourself, well, now, what influences the values, the beliefs, and the assumptions? Well, the last piece of the model is the values are influenced by geography. They're influenced by history. They're influenced by religion. And you can say exactly the same for the beliefs and for the assumptions. So in, in, in many presentations on this topic, with an American audience, you'll say, well, what is the dominant value in the United States? And you'll find people, especially if there are people from other nationalities present, they'll say, oh, well, we're uh, very materialistic. We value money. We value success. We value work. But if you actually think back to what's the icon of like the great American value, I, I think you could say it was the cowboy. And it's freedom. It's the ability to go wherever you want. It's you and your horse and head west. And you are an individual who goes wherever he or she wants. That, I think, is accepted as the dominant value in, Mex in, in, in the United States. Now, if you go down to Mexico and you try and unearth the, um, the dominant value, let's say, in Mexico, you don't have to dig very much, and it's true of pretty much all Latin America and pretty much all of the Southern Hemisphere. The dominant value is family. It's everything is about family. Now, that doesn't mean they don't believe in freedom or individualism or any of the other values that we have out there. But the dominant prioritized value is family. And everybody looks at their society through that primordial lens of, of, of family. So what is that model suggesting? It, it, uh, I'd like to give you, as it were, two definitions of, of culture. One is, um, and let me just pop it up in case you're interested. It's, um, the way in which people solve problems. So that, that's the definition that Franz Trumpenars, who's a Dutchman from the Netherlands, uh, that's the way he sums it up. And von Strumpenhaus is the one who made cross-cultural, intercultural training very, very uh, sort of up to date with business executives. He's had a lot of success in the business world. On a more academic, esoteric uh, level, it's Gert Hofstede, who you'll see quoted a lot. He's the one who sort of worked through all the different dimensions of culture. And the, the phrase, he was somewhat ahead of his time when he said it, the phrase he used was um, that culture is like the software of the mind. It's what programs the way you think. And in my little effort to put all of that together and getting back to the model of the iceberg, I would say that culture, as I'm talking about it here, are the shared assumptions, values, and beliefs that produce, that result in a characteristic behavior. So when I got off the plane in Kennedy Airport and came out and saw characteristic behaviors in New York City, I'm able to go back and say, well, I'm really looking at the shared values, beliefs, and assumptions that have been crystallized in a particular type of behavior. So let's say you're going on a people to people mission and you have to go to China. And you say, let's Let's dig deeper into Chinese culture. The easiest thing to do is find somebody who is Chinese or knows something about Chinese culture and help through your questions work through what are the dominant values. And it doesn't mean they're mutually exclusive with ours, ours being US ones. It's just the way we prioritize them is somewhat different. But it changes then the way that, that we make our cultural decisions. Now, the last piece of all of that, and I've already mentioned it, are the values. And I'm, I'm going to stop here in a second, just so if anybody wants to ask a question, because I think I'm over about a half an hour now. Um, typical values that we would use in the cross-cultural world, 
would be how do we value relationships? Well, in Iceland, relationships are less of a group thing and it's more about the individual. But you go down to Mexico, it's all about relationships. You go to China, it's absolutely all about relationships. You go to Japan, everything is a team. The, the individual, you, you, you don't reward individuals, you, you reward teams. Another value is the way we manage time. That's a huge one. That's one that gets us into a huge amount of trouble. In the States, we're extremely organized. We're extremely scheduled. I remember as a kid growing up in Ireland, they used to say, when God made time, he made plenty of it. Which means that as, as a culture, we're not as focused on linear time. Uh, so this is supposed to be a half an hour conference. Well, if it's 35 minutes, if it's 40 minutes, and if it's interesting, is it a big deal? I, I mean, that's on a deep cultural level. You go down to Mexico, and uh, their, their, their big value, of course, is harmony and family and friendship. So you ask somebody when they can get it done, and you're talking in a time thing, and then they'll say, well, we could have it for you mañana, which translates as tomorrow, of course. And so if you're your classical gringo, and worse yet, if you're a German or you're, you're from Denmark, you say, okay, you'll have it for me tomorrow, and what time? And then give you something vague, ah, I don't know, around the end of the day. And you actually go to bed thinking that tomorrow somebody's going to come, without realizing that tomorrow means I like you too much and I respect you too much to tell you I'm not going to do it or I can't do it. So I just throw out this, um, do it tomorrow. And you got to understand, it could mean tomorrow, but it probably means that, no, nope, I'm not going to be able to do that. And there's no need to get offended because the Mexican, by saying, I'll do it for you tomorrow, is actually trying not to be offensive. The other one, and I learned that's my pearl when I first went to Mexico, you're looking for somewhere, you're on the road doing the middle of nowhere, and you ask somebody, let's say, I don't know, where's the bank in the next town? You know, and they say, well, uh, yeah, drive down this road about five miles and you'll come to a sign and then make a right and go into the town and uh, ask somebody there. They'll tell you where the bank is. It's probably on your right as you go in. And then you drive 100 miles down the road and there was no turn off and you realize the guy who told you that hadn't got a clue. But he didn't want to tell you, I don't know where to send you. I really want to respect you. And I, I'm just saying Mexico, but you could say this about India, Pakistan. China, there are variations of all of these dimensions, right? The other one is communication, direct communication, indirect communication. The states, we are fairly direct, but not nearly as direct as they would be, let's say, in Denmark. If you want to know what somebody really thinks, ask, ask a Dane, and they will tell you, you know, the classic thing was this, does this little black dress make me look fat? I, I assume if you're managed, uh, married to a Dane, you, you'll, you'll be told yay or nay, they do not beat around the bush. Now again, you bring the Dane over here and we think, oh, well, that guy is a little bit uncouth. I mean, you know, I, I asked for an opinion, but I didn't expect it to be that direct. If he goes down to Mexico, he gets into terrible trouble. He gets into terrible trouble. And uh, same holds for China everywhere else. Then a bias toward action, hierarchy, and how we deal with rules. Um, in, 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 in countries, for example, this is from today, Singapore is a very rules-oriented society. The rule is terribly important. And if we all obey the rules, we will all live very well. So you could, you know, get a heavy fine if you're in the wrong place or, or, or anything like that. Um, but here's the deal. If you're going, uh, coming into Singapore, and I heard this today on a, on a conference about this topic, you're coming in from Vietnam, you have to, first of all, prove that you haven't got the COVID-19. You have to take a test before you get to Singapore. And again, not to make a long story of it, this guy came the other day from Vietnam, got off the plane in Singapore, and they said, uh, you've uh, taken the test, but we need you to, and he was positive, you need to quarantine for 14 days. And the guy said, oh, well, 14 days locked up in my hotel. He didn't say this to, to the health people. What he did is he went to the food court and gave himself a lovely pie dinner. 
and very stupidly took a picture of himself, the eternal selfie, put it on Facebook. The Thai authorities saw that. So he didn't, he was supposed to go from the airport to quarantine. That's the rule. He didn't do that. And he was put in jail for eight weeks. And like, there's nothing wrong with that, but other countries, maybe you could talk your way out of that, as they say, or they might give you a chance, or they, they, there might be some variation on it. Uh, I remember once in Ireland, a cop stopped me in the dark when I'd been in Mexico for a long time, went back to Ireland, and it was raining heavily. And I see this policeman on the street just outside the train station, and I'm driving. And I said to my wife, what, what does this guy want? I'm like, this is weird, because I'm used to American cops where you're going to have lights and all this. And... He was just checking the registration on vehicles. You know, he comes along with a little lamp and he looked and your registration tag is good. Uh, good night, sir. Walks along. Completely different model of policing. And so without going into more detail and leave us some chance for questions, if you go back to the model of the values, the beliefs, and the assumptions, you say like our number one value would be freedom in the United States, just to use that model. So... And then that, that really dictates an awful lot of how we behave. And then you get to beliefs. And you remember I said geography, uh, history, and religion impact all of that. Say, well, what's the belief system here in the United States? Well, it's, it'll evolve over time. But the fundamental one that seems to, to affect most of our religious thinking, if you will, a belief system influenced by religious thinking is Protestant Puritism. So it doesn't mean we're all Protestant and it doesn't mean we're all Puritanical, but the way we deal with the law, the way we deal with welfare, the way we deal with so many social issues, it's really a sort of a, a, a Protestant Puritanical uh, bias that came from the Mayflower and has trickled and dominated our belief system. And then to finish and say, well, what about our assumptions? Well, just think of, you know, Nike, you can do it or just do it or, or you can be whatever you want to be. Like in the United States, it's incredible when you come from a, a slightly more formal country, slightly more formal like Ireland or England, and you meet American children for the first time. They are incredibly optimistic. They have such a can-do atmosphere. Uh, you meet them in college and what do you want to be? I'm going to be a nuclear physicist. Oh, great. And, and what are you majoring in? at the moment uh, um, journalism or communications that doesn't stop them it's they know they can be they believe they can be anything they want to be as opposed let's say to an english model the older english model that you know children should be seen and not heard so i think i've said enough to give you a sense the way those assumptions are formed and then finally, you have the geography and, and, and the history. The states has two huge borders with two countries. Ireland technically really only has one border, and we're surrounded by water. Germany has a whole host of borders. I remember in a, in a session with German executives, I asked a young German, young, he was probably 25, 28, uh, could he name the countries around Germany? He couldn't list the countries that bordered on Germany. And I guess that's a sort of a post-war thing, that it's just let's not focus on all of that. But it's very different if you have six or seven borders, you have two borders, you have a huge amount of coastline, or you're just a small island out in the Atlantic like Ireland is, and you're just surrounded by water. And where when I left Ireland in 1966, there were 2,000 Jews in Ireland. And they were widely, you know, liked. They were part of everything. But there were only 2,000. We hardly knew them. And if you were black, you weren't African-American, you were probably studying medicine and you probably came from Nigeria. And I remember as a kid going to the hospital and gosh, you hoped you got a black doctor because by far and away, they were the best, they were the nicest and they had the reputation of being the greatest. So those values, beliefs and assumptions shaped by the history, the geography and the religion are what produce our behaviors, which that behavior which characterizes the group is what we call culture. Now it's a quarter of seven, so I don't know if I've talked too much and if it's made any sense to you, um, but this would be a good time if anybody has a question or an emotional outburst or, or whatever. 
we have uh, one question from Ed Tucker. Ed, if you can please unmute yourself and state your question. Okay, I think I managed to unmute myself. You did? Yeah, I, hear you. I, yes. I, I did list the question and I'm fortunate that I did uh, write it down in the chat box so that I could remember it. Uh, will COVID-19 serve as a common problem that will affect our cultural responses around the world? I, I think you touched on this a little bit when you mentioned what Singapore, uh, Singaporeans might do, but do we have a common denominator, a common problem that will elicit a, a common response or concern? Yes. I think the simple answer is yes, there, but, but, but the common response will be influenced by the deep culture. So the way they have responded in Singapore or in China is not at all the way we've responded in the United States. And there's no suggestion of criticism. The, the thing one has to be very careful with the whole cultural thing. One culture is absolutely not better than another. And let me state as part of that answer, Ed, if you'll bear with me, that we are trained as managers and as students, I would say, and up to a point maybe even as parents, we solve problems. Problems are made to be solved. Cultural problems are not really problems. They're more like, it's better to think of them as dilemmas. And you do not solve a dilemma, you reconcile dilemmas. So you'll have one way in Thailand of approaching the COVID crisis, and I'll have a very different way in Germany and a very different way in Sweden. Just think of the way the Swedes have done it, where it was like, let's go for the herd immunity. And the way, let's say, we did it in the United States. And the way we do that is influenced by our culture. For example, all of those countries the common enemy at the moment is COVID-19 and we all want to eliminate it. But in China, they were able to do a massive lockdown straight away that just wouldn't have flown, I think, in the United States. Why? Because we're about freedom and nobody is going to tell us. A, a corollary of that is the use of masks. Pretty much all over Asia, those of you who have gone to Asia, I mean, masks are the most common thing that you see in Japan, Vietnam, uh, certainly China, just maybe for pollution, not people sneezing, whatever. It's part of the culture. It's perfectly okay to wear a mask. Americans are not so good about the masks. I, you know, I, I'm not saying all Americans, but I'm saying it's, again, this freedom thing. We don't want to be told what to do. Now, more directly to your question, Ed, I've thought about that myself because I've been watching Ireland. My brother is one of these lung specialists, so he's very involved in it. He gets you depressed, actually, because he gives you all the latest statistics and you say, oh my God, this is, this is not good. But Ireland is a country that doesn't normally go too much for rule following. When I was a little kid and, you know, there would be a big double-decker bus coming along the street and this traffic light was red, People in Dublin would walk right out in front of the bus and like, aha, kill me, come on. And then they would cross. Uh, I, I'm not saying it's as bad as that now, but we don't like to be told what to do. Yet several years ago, somebody said, the Minister for Health, we're not going to smoke anymore in public houses, restaurants, anywhere in public. And the next day, smoking stopped, literally. And nobody can understand really why. They must have frightened the daylights out of them or whatever, but they just said, okay. The second one is, and this applies to some of us here, not, not all of you, but if you were 70 years old in Ireland for the last three, what is it now? We've been at this for, what, two months, three months. It was illegal to leave your house if you were 70. You couldn't even go to the store to shop. You had to get somebody to do your shopping for you. You couldn't go out. And people follow that religiously. Now, my brother happens to live beside the sea. He can walk down the driveway, cross the road, and he's on a beach, and there's nobody on the beach. Do you think he would do that and go down to the beach and walk around on the beach when the law said, if you're 70, can't go out? They followed it to the letter in Ireland. Now, that's not quite what we've seen in the States. And so I, I hope I've sort of answered the question in an oblique sort of a way. 
everybody's concerned. We all want to stop it. Sweden said, well, we all follow rules and the government doesn't need to tell you what to do. And we have a great rapport between the government and the people. So continue life as normal and just be careful. And the herd immunity will take care of it. And I may be misstating what the, what the Swedes were doing, but it hasn't really worked for them. New Zealand, which is out in the middle of nowhere, if you think of our first map, certainly in terms of where we're from. But they're 2,000 miles, I think, from Australia, the nearest land. So they locked down, and now there's absolutely, there's no virus in New Zealand. And you say, wow, they, they were able to do it. But why? That's geography. It's also history. It's also their belief system. They listen to the government. They like their prime minister. And Anyway, I'm probably repeating myself now. There might be another question. Yeah, thank you. Does, does, it, does that make sense? Yes, it does. I appreciate it very much. Uh, we have a next question from Andres. Uh, Andres, please unmute yourself and state your question. Yep, sure. Thank you. So you, you mentioned that it takes uh, many generations to shape or form some of our beliefs and behaviors, right? Yes. How do you suggest we individually address those behaviors that may, may be against or may uh, uh, conflict with others culturally so as to not to offend people when it's something that is so ingrained in us and you know can create you know we have biases already built in yeah that's really a, a great question and, and i'll tell you why andres because uh, those of us who are involved in this both academically and then from a business perspective I, I mentioned Moran Stalin Boyer at the beginning, which was the, probably the premier cross-cultural training firm in the world, at least up Boulder, Colorado. And their approach, and my approach, would be cognitive where you have a model. But as I said at the beginning, then it's really how do you adapt to the other culture? It's not nearly enough to know what it's like in Pakistan or India or in Afghanistan or in Italy. You say, okay, it's not better or worse, it's surely different. Now, how do I behave? And how do I behave when we seem to have opposite positions, let's say on something as sensitive as bribery? Like, bribery is pretty endemic in some countries. It's just part of the way we do business. And so then you're a corporate American uh, corporate guy, a US corporate guy, and you go down to parts of Mexico, you go to parts of China, and uh, there are all sorts of suggestions made and nobody considers it bribery, but you're looking at your handbook and you're saying this is high rate of bribery and then you don't do the business, you don't get the contract. So you're faced with how do I reconcile my culture with, with these different norms, this different understanding, this different value system in the other country. And that's why uh, obviously you, you, Culture is a, is a huge problem because you, we think we read a book about it or watch a DVD about it or listen to somebody like me talk for a half an hour about it. And then like, how do we deal with it? It's, it's extraordinarily complex. It's really, your, your question is, how do you adapt? And my answer to that is, you have to be self-aware enough to ask your question. Say, is there a cultural thing here? And you can be pretty sure there is. And what is the other person value system let's say it's values that are going to cause the the, the 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 problem and then i think it's not really a problem that's the way in mexico you don't show up on time for certain meetings it would be just bad form to show up at eight o'clock for an eight o'clock meeting so you're going to show up a little bit later especially for a dinner if you invited me to your house for dinner at eight o'clock and i showed up at eight o'clock uh, it would be quite embarrassing. You wouldn't be ready for me at all. And I'm saying, well, so how do I deal with that? So I have to look at that behavior, look at my behavior, and then really between us look in a different direction and say, well, I need to adapt to that. And I make it easier for myself by not being so judgmental about it. It's a totally different approach towards time. It's a totally different approach towards what I consider black and white bribery in a country maybe that's poorer, where they have an uneducated bureaucracy, where they don't have the technology that we do, where they don't have the legal infrastructures that we have. You gotta put all of that into the mix and say, and I think this is what people to people is all about, how do we build bridges? 
and and it's it's literally it's building the bridges it's not declaring war on it it's not trying to change the other person's culture and it's surely not leaving my own culture either that's the other thing when people go native you know like i hate being a gringo i'm going to be a mexican and all my brothers and sisters down no we have to understand ours understand theirs and reconcile it first of all it's what i'm trying to say is you have to uh, distinct what's the, what's the word pick understand the differences say these are the differences okay so this is what is different now how do we reconcile it and then that's different for every culture but absolutely um that's what we have to do i don't think that came out as clear as it was sounding at the beginning but anyway is there more to be added to that or somebody else have some thought on it well, we have uh, a next question, if nobody is adding to that, uh, from Dr. Selim Khan. Uh, he's mute. Okay. You're on mute. All right. Uh, so, Jack, my question was that when US and Russian astronauts they meet at the International Space Station. Do they get any special training before they leave the Earth? So that they can understand each other and because there's a lot of cultural differences. To, to be candid, I don't know, but I, I did state at the beginning that the US military is very advanced in um, cross-cultural training. I had a son-in-law who, who uh, um, ended up as a major in Afghanistan, and I was amazed at the cross-cultural. It, it was very action-oriented. It was like, when you get there, this is what you need to understand, and this is what you're going to see, and it's neither bad nor good. It's just, this is how you deal with this. And so it was very action-oriented. It didn't get into any deep academic explanation, but it did go through the values, beliefs, assumptions of people in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq and Iran. So all of that to say, I don't know what NASA does, but my guess is that they do train them to go up. If not, I would think there could be very heated conversations <laughs> up, in, up in this space thing where these guys are all together. Like we just look the way we are with this COVID emergency where we're all stuck at home and ready to kill each other, some of us. Uh, so stuck up in the, in, in the space capsule and space station. The quick answer is, the honest answer is, I don't know if they get it. My assumption as they do. Has anybody any thought what the difference would be? I mean, what would be the things that would strike the Americans about the Russians and the Russians about the Americans? Like, where would the cultural differences come from? Like, because some of the differences are going to be personality. The American astronaut could be a stereotypical extrovert like me, I'm pretty stereotypical extrovert. And so, hi, how are you all doing? Let's have a conversation. Where are you from? How long have you been up here? Wow, look at the view. Did you take any photographs? Have you got kids? And I'd be like, and the other guy is an introvert, the Russian. And he's probably sitting in a corner saying, you know, leave me alone. I, I don't want to talk to you. Ed. Yeah, I, I think the biggest question would be for each of them, are these people following the mission or are they following the dictates of their country of origin? Do they have orders that are superior to the mission? And, and my guess is that they're trained to focus on the mission. Yeah, yeah, and, I uh, completely agree. Yeah. And uh, that, that's gotta be a cultural obstacle that has to be overcome. Yeah, and you, you also, you've asked and answered in a sense, because when you have the mission, then that's what it's all about. It's about the mission. It's not about the American way to do the mission, or it's not about the Russian way to do the mission. This is what we've got to do. We've got to take these measurements. We've got to do all of these experiments, and this is how we're going to do them, and they'll have protocols for it. In their personal conversations as they get to know each other, though, I think that's when the cultural stuff will come out. And it'll be the Russian guy maybe will miss his family more than the American might project initially. And the Russian might think, wow, I, I remember the first Russian colleague that I had. Uh, it, it was a question a friend of ours was going to, but it's a quick digression. He was going to bring a sailboat to Indiana on a lake, on a big lake. This was a sort of this big, big sailboat. And it 
didn't really fit on these little lakes out in Indiana. But we were trying to figure which of the two lakes would be best. One was slightly bigger than the other, but it was six of one, a half dozen of the other. And our Russian friend opined, you should go to this lake. And we said, why? He said, because the water is more blue. And we were like, but well, it's about depth. It's about wind. It's about all of the rest. But it was just a totally different way of, it's not a great example, but it was, he had a different way of looking at things. And I remember because I'm tall and therefore I have reasonably proportional, I would say, feet to my size. And um, he, he would say when in Russia back in the day, he'd go out to buy a pair of shoes. He'd go in and say, I want a pair of, uh, I want a size 12 pair of shoes. And if they had a size 12 in the store, that was the one you bought. You didn't ask if they were red or if they were black or if they were brown. If there was one size 12, you took it. And he personally was overwhelmed with the choices when he came to the States. He said, like, if you go into a supermarket and you want to, your wife said, get some cereal for the kids. Like, they're literally four rows, 50 yards long of cereals. Do I get Cheerios? Do I get Crumbs? Do I get Weetabix? Do I get this? Do I get that? And he used to tell us how stressful too many choices were. So if you will, it's a bit of an inane example. But I would say when the Russian depending if he's from a big city, small city, whether he's been to the States or not, but the classic Russian, the classic American, once they're finished talking about the mission stuff and they sit down and reminisce, that's when they'd start to note these deep differences that might not be alienating at all. They'd probably be quite complementary and they'd probably learn a lot from each other. In, in, in multicultural teams, in teams where people come from different countries, uh, there's absolutely no doubt that the productivity soars, especially the, the uh, innovation, different ways of thinking. It's, it's just uh, the, the thing I'm most grateful for probably in my life is having been involved in so many different cultural situations. It just shakes you up and, and, and you think completely differently. Anyway, that was a long answer for a simple question. Hey, Jack, it's Mary yeah. Sella. Yeah. My cousin is a rocket scientist with NASA. Oh. So I just texted her the question, and she says the astronauts are told to leave all politics behind. No borders up there, and camaraderie is number one. Yeah, that's, that's uh, tell us she should get onto the call answer. here. No, because you see, that's, that's the superficial behavior. So there's no politics, but culture, like politics is influenced by culture, but culture is not politics. It's camaraderie does the I'm, I'm being a little facetious mary but the uh, which also by the way the cultural reaction you know an american i'm going to check this right now and i'm going to call somebody in nasa and i'm going to get you the answer our mexican friend might say yeah that sounds like a good idea i might yeah who do we know in nasa well yeah i'm going to have dinner with him or her next week and we're totally different approach so we got the answer right now and i agree obviously with the answer but uh, i think the culture issue is deeper it's how do you how do you take the camaraderie? I see Frederick has his hand up. Am I right? Uh, you just need to unmute her. They have to let you talk, I think. Uh, Jack, can I ask you a follow-up question to... Uh... Yeah, I saw Frederick wave, waving his hand. So I don't mean, maybe he was saying, oh, he's saying goodbye, I think. Okay, all right. Yes, Salim. Okay, so let's suppose um, you are a consultant and uh, this big company, uh, there are ch uh, people um, visiting from US, China, and Ireland, and uh, they are in Japan. And you went there as a consultant. How would you help them in the background of Japanese culture with these uh, uh, people from three different backgrounds? Yeah, I, I would. Uh... Assume for a second there must be some sort of a problem that they have wanted a consultant because they only bring in consultants when there are problems. And of course, the great part of being a consultant is you try and fix it and then you leave. Um, but I would say what would seem to be the problem. And they very often don't know how to articulate what the problem is. It's just no. Um, the Chinese guys here at the table when we have meetings are inscrutable. Oh, no, we didn't. Yeah, we had Chinese. They're inscrutable. 
like we don't know what they really want and we also don't know why they get upset when we show up a bit later or we don't sit in the usual seat that we were assigned the japanese guys on the other hand don't be able they, they don't seem to be able to make a decision for themselves they all have to check with the boss they all have to like this group thing and, and they can't just say here's what i think and they don't ever seem to disagree with their boss and they're so formal and stuck up with some stuff that they're very hard to deal with the irish guys in general are probably delightful you know really fun people <laughs> I'm kidding. The Irish guys will probably come across maybe as being uh, maybe a little bit too informal, uh, come across as pretty friendly, not very aggressive, uh, maybe a little bit too direct though for the Chinese and for the Japanese. And the Americans seem to, you know, they seem to be doing okay with the, uh, the Irish guys. And in fact, now you have the Irish and the Americans who are having problem with the one or two Chinese guys on the team. And granted that the context is Japan, they're dealing with the Japanese and uh, there's all the problems that go with that. Like one of the big things in Japan is the, the Shinto religion, if you want to call it that, and, and Confucianism. So Shinto is about, if you remember your karate, you know, the kata is the form. So the Japanese were very concerned with procedure and form and quality and how you do it. and. Uh, like a blemish in a finished product, a cosmetic blemish is not tolerated in Japan. Whereas the Irish guys would say, well, if you lower the price a little bit, it's not the end of the world. And the Confucianism would be all about structures. And so the Japanese and, uh, uh, and the, the Japanese would be very heavily influenced by Confucianism, as are the, um, the Chinese, obviously. And so the big thing for them would be... Um, the, the sort of the relationship and not upsetting the group. And so where it would come in is maybe, let's say the boss is American and he comes in and he says to the Japanese guy, hey, whatever your name is, Fujimoto, you've done a fantastic job and you're gonna get a very special bonus. And he sees the, the American makes the, the Japanese guy blush because the Japanese guy said, it wasn't me, it was my team. You can't pick me out. They would have the, we say the squeaky wheel gets the grease. They say that the nail that sticks out gets hammered back in. And so they're the sort of dilemmas that would come up. So in the conversation, you'd see what are the, the points of contention. They don't have to be huge. They don't have to be like pre-World War III. Some of them will, 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 will have to do with personality. Some of them will just be very extroverted, others introverted, others terribly structured, the others not structured. Their personality difference, we get those out of the way. So you might want to understand a little bit of our personality first, and then things that we grew up in in our countries that are not necessarily indicative of, uh, of, of our deep cultures. But the way we respond in a team, the way we respond to hierarchy, the way we respond to formality, I would go back to those... Uh, values, that circle of values that I mentioned, and say, I look at how are we managing time? You know, in, in some cultures, time is absolutely, time is money. It is of the essence. You start and you finish on time. The Irish should be a bit more relaxed about that. Um, the other one would be uh, relationships. The Chinese and the Japanese would be all about relationships. The Irish would be more relationships and the, the Americans would be more individual. They leave the relationships for when we go home. The Americans also would get into an argument and a fight at work, and the Chinese and the Japanese would be quite horrified. But then the Americans who got into the fight at work, they'd go out for a drink with the Irish that night, and they'd completely forget about what happened at work. But that same problem would inhibit the Chinese and the Japanese from going out together. So I, I'm probably, again, rambling a little bit, but it, it would be along the dimensions of relationships, time, direct communication um, and, and how we handle conflict. Jack, um, it's all true and throughout your presentation you mentioned the differences but my specific question was and I gave you those three countries uh, and in Japan uh, they are sitting they could be sitting in some other place too but how do you as a coach help them 
uh, develop more harmony for the project for which they have gathered? Well, that goes back to what was asked before about the NASA thing. First of all, what is the project? So we all look at the project and we delineate very clearly what the project is. They're going to have to tell me that. I'm not going to tell them what it is. So now we're going to all work on this project. And then uh, normally, just as a generic sort of coach to the team, I wouldn't start necessarily on culture at all. I'd have the project and then I would look at personality difference. Like something as basic as the Myers-Briggs type indicator, personality types, have the introverts understand how the extroverts are, how the structured are compared to the unstructured, and give them all a little personality profile and say, does this make sense? And they'll say, oh, yes. Then as you work down, it turns out that, you know, there'll be problems that have to do maybe with arrogance or, or or personality traits that you're saying, okay, so we, we deal with those. And then as we work down and we see cultural ones, where, uh, and of course, in a corporation, they're usually used to working together, which is a little bit like the space station, you know, they're, they're willing to work together. But you'll find that um, the Japanese will come across as very inscrutable. And it's very hard to know if, if, if they agree with you or they don't agree with you. Is adopted by those members in attendance. That is six guests. That's just extraneous audio coming in, right? Do you guys hear that? No. Okay, I'm hearing different audio here. But anyway, so if if let's say the issue became uh, the Japanese being unscrutable and not seeming to want to make their minds up, then that particular issue, then we'd look at the cultural model. And then we would look at time dimensions, for example, and what's time like for the Japanese, what's it like for the Chinese, and what's it like for the Americans. And it's a completely different notion, different management of time. When you look at how we handle conflict, the Americans will state the conflict straight away, and like I say, get it out of the way and then go to dinner. The Chinese and the Japanese, it's all about harmony. They're not going to want to verbalize the conflict. So that takes you then into communication. It's going to be much more indirect communication. You have to pick up that with few words. They're actually saying, I don't agree with you at all. In fact, I, I don't agree with anything that you're saying, but they don't say it. Anyway, I, I, I could keep going on. You'd, you'd have to find a specific problem, but I've thrown out ones that could deal with time, uh, direct, indirect communication, hierarchy, structure, uh, <coughs> following the rules. The American might want to follow the Robert's rules of order. This is the way we're going to do things. And the Chinese guys say, no, I'm, I'm the boss. I'm the senior guy. I'm the only one that makes motions. I'm the only one that proves anything. Here. I'm the one who sits at the head of the table. So without going into something more specific, it typically as a consultant, I find you're called in for a problem. Like the corporation thinks that the, the, the CEO uh, is not working well. He's too American in a Mexican environment. Uh, I did a big one in Chile with a mining company where you had people from all over the world. And uh, it, it was the same, like culture is getting in the way of everything. It's causing safety problems because some people follow the rules and some people don't follow the rules. And there's some nationalities that just won't follow the rules. And the other ones, like the Germans would be, you follow every rule here. And they would seem exaggerated to the, uh, the guys from Bolivia, let's say. So there's always a, a, a specific issue that you're brought in to deal with and then usually that one issue then evolves down into all sorts of other things that could be everything from gender differences to psychological differences to age differences where you've got the the younger generations the older generation then then all those conflicts come out too okay let's find out if there is any other more question uh, i do not see any uh, more questions here in the chat. Right. Okay, so uh, I think it's a, <clears throat> it's a good time to wrap up. Yes. I want to thank everyone who joined today. It has been a very interesting hour. And uh, once again, uh, about People to People International, I, I want to remind those of you who are not members yet that please do that. It's very simple. 
you can contact me or Jean Raleigh. We both are co-presidents. Uh, or you can contact uh, uh, our um, uh, director, executive director, uh, Alan, or even send an email or text message to Naveed and we'll make sure that uh, you become the member. And uh, we hope uh, all of you can join for our upcoming interesting events. I think the next one is somewhere in August. Um, it would be by Carla Stone. So thank you everyone again and good night. Okay, thank you all. Bye-bye.